Okay, so good morning. The microphone. Okay, so good morning. Uh, today we go on with the um, uh, let's say description of the A22 15.4, which is basically the uh, lower layers of the uh, Internet of Things. Okay, to say, in the sense that as we have mentioned yesterday, uh, the first two layers, starting from the bottom, in the physical layer and the medium access control layer, they are shared between uh, the two protocol stacks, which are actually fighting one another to, to, let's say, win over the Internet of Things, which are the 6 n one and the ZigBee one, okay? So, starting from today, we will start, uh, uh, let's say, describing these first two layers, meaning the physical layer and the medium access control layer, which, again, is common to uh, most of the deployment in the field of the Internet of Things, okay? And this is called uh, 802.15.4 family, okay? Standard family. Uh, this is standards, meaning that uh, it's basically a uh, description of protocols which are promoted by the IEEE, which is an organization which takes care of uh, most of the, let's say, standardization uh, activities in the field of uh, communications, okay? Uh, you may have heard of other uh, standards of this type, for example, the IEEE uh, 802.11, Okay, which is Wi-Fi, is actually part of this standardization process uh, to define you know, protocols to uh, manage the communication of, uh, um, between any, uh, let's say, network device. Okay? This slide just shows some of the names which you may have heard. Okay? I already mentioned uh, at the top right the 82.11 standard. Uh, you may have heard about the 82.16 standard, which was also known as WiMAX in, uh, in recent past. And I guess that I, you will see, I mean, those of you who, have, who are actually attending the course on wireless networks, they're actually seeing in more details uh, both Wi-Fi and WiMAX standards, okay? And then there's a bunch of other uh, standard families uh, which are dealing uh, on standardizing different types of communication protocols, okay? What we are interested in is the so-called uh, 802.15 group, okay, which is represented with this, you know, big, uh, you know, uh, light blue uh, square in the slide, uh, which is again responsible of standardizing whatever uh, is uh, uh, referring to wireless personal area networks. So, if you remember, one of the first classes we made this distinction between. Uh, different types of networks and technologies for developing networks depending on basically the range, the communication range, okay? Uh, what 802.15 is doing is to propose protocols which are actually doable, applicable, okay, to uh, networks of personal range. And by personal range, I mean uh, networks uh, with, you know, an, let's say, an extension on, of up to tens of meters. Okay, so we are talking about uh, networks made of tens of meters. Okay, within this uh, 82.15 group, uh, there is again a uh, further subdivision. Okay, for example, uh, there are part of this group, uh, the so-called task group one. Okay, which is actually Bluetooth. So whatever is uh, known as Bluetooth is actually coming from a standard from the IEEE. Okay. Uh, which belongs to this uh, 8.15 standardization group dealing with personal error network, okay? And also this uh, Bluetooth thing here, you will be seeing in uh, wireless networks, so in the other course, okay? Uh, what we're interested in here, okay, is this task group four, so meaning 
within the family A2.15, we are looking at the work carried out by these guys in the task group 4, okay, which is actually uh, designing protocols for personal error network uh, with the feature of being low rate ones. Okay? So we are talking about networks whose rate, uh, and by rate I mean the capability to transfer bits, okay, is very limited. Okay? Or let's say it's more limited than Bluetooth, it's more limited than Wi-Fi. Okay? So our goal here is just to see what is in this box here. So what is in the box called h.15.4, okay? So let's look uh, into this box here, okay? Uh, this is another picture which uh, shows the activities of these, you know, subgroups within the dot, uh, 15, sorry, within the 802.15 uh, main group, okay? And what we are interested in here is in this uh, right-hand side branch, Okay, so all the activities which goes under the name of 15.4. Okay, uh, as you can see, if you look at this uh, right hand side branch, uh, there's not just one standard. So there's not just one, let's say, box representing this kind of standard. Okay, but actually, the standards which are proposed in this field are uh, more than one. Okay, and the idea is uh, the following. Okay, uh, we are in the 15 in the 802.15 group, okay, and then depending on the specific technology, under the technology, okay, each one of these subgroups is defining, let's say, different layers uh, starting from the medium access control part. If you uh, know, I mean, you should know that medium access control <laughs> is, uh, let's say, those set of pro uh, protocols, uh, algorithms, or rules, okay which, uh, let's say, manage the access of multiple stations to a shared channel, okay? Which means that, uh, uh, depending that you're talking about Bluetooth, left-hand side branch, depending whether you're talking about high-rate uh, uh, low-hand networks, which is 15.3, or depending that you're talking about 15.4, okay, you need to have different medium access control solutions. You do actually have different medium access control solution, which means that the stations access the channel, as we will see, in different ways, depending on what the type of network you are actually considering, which is kind of obvious, right? So, focusing on the 15.4 part, which is this branch here, okay, uh, all the underlying solutions have the same medium access control sublayer, which means that they all share the same rules to access the medium, okay, but they do differentiate depending on the specific, uh, uh, let's say, physical layer which you're actually using to transmit information, okay? And in the 15.4, okay, you have actually three of those. So the 15.4 standard specifies three different physical layers, okay? Uh, which basically are different depending on the bandwidth they're actually using to transmit information, okay? Or better. Uh, they are different depending on the spectrum they are using to send information, okay? As you know, whenever you are talking about wireless uh, systems or wireless uh, networks, okay, the first thing you have to define is the spectrum band which you are actually using to send information, okay? Uh, which is the portion of the frequencies which are dedicated or, let's say, shared, okay, to actually uh, set the transmission at those frequencies, okay? And in 15.4, there are actually three of these, uh, let's say, frequency bands, okay? The first one is a, a sub-gigahertz band, meaning a bandwidth below one gigahertz, okay? Around uh, 800 gigahertz, okay? This is true for Europe, for example, and this is the equivalent uh, sub-gigahertz band for the US, because in the US you cannot use those 800 uh, megahertz bandwidth, okay, and then there is a, um, let's say, uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, physical layer, okay, which is again defined by the 15.4 uh, standards. So you have basically, you can choose depending on the type of, uh, uh, let's say, environment you are in, okay, which one of those physical layer you are willing to use, okay. Uh, one comment. 
all these uh, bands here, so uh, sub gigahertz ones and uh, 2.4 gigahertz one, okay, they are all, they are all uh, what's called ISM bands. You know what ISM is? Industrial, scientific, and medical bands, which means that they are license-free, okay? So basically, uh, everyone, in principle, can actually set up a transmission system which is operating in those bands without having to pay for licenses, okay? So without to, having to pay for uh, the use of those specific resources. Okay, uh, which is good on one side because you spare money. Okay, however, it's not good because uh, as uh, is true for every everything which is free. Okay, this resource, any free resource, is overcrowded or tends to be overcrowded. So you know, a lot of people, since it's free, okay, are willing actually to use that because you know, it's free. Okay, uh, which means that. Uh, uh, whatever you do in those frequencies, uh, you have to do it <coughs> being very careful on how you manage what is called interference. Okay, so you have to be very, let's say, accurate in coping with uh, interference, <coughs> and you know, uh, in such a way that you know uh, your, let's say, ultimate performance uh, is let's say acceptable. Okay. Uh, what is the, let's say bitrate or capacity which you can expect out of these systems. Always remember that we're talking about low rate uh, systems, okay? So depending on the band that you're using, you can go uh, from 20 kilobits per second, or actually as low as 2 kilobits per second, okay? Up to, if you're lucky, to 250 kilobits per second, okay? Uh, one disclaimer here. Those numbers, okay, which are in the slides, uh, are nominal bit rates which means that uh, they are the theoretical bit rates uh, which you can expect uh, out of those technologies in the paper, okay? As usual, uh, you have to scale down these numbers here, okay, for different factors. The first one is that uh, um, you're not, uh, let's say, um, you, you are in the real environment, which means that uh, you have uh, propagation impairments, so you have multiple fading, you have all these kind of physical layer impairments, such that the nominal rate can hardly be reached, okay? Second thing, bandwidth is shared, which means that out of this nominal rate, uh, you have to cut off uh, all the portion of those rate, of that rate, uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, for which you are competing with other stations, okay? Which means that you cannot expect to have the entire 250 kilobits per second for you, okay? Because there is other people, okay, around. Um, third thing, this is uh, physical rate, uh, meaning that this is the bits per second which are sent over the physical late rate. So it's the capacity of the physical pipe uh, which is uh, represented by your channel, okay? Which means that uh, since the information which is sent at the physical late rate contains also the overhead, okay, coming from the, all the upper layers, okay? The application rate, uh, so the, let's say, meaningful bit from the application point of view, okay, are much fewer than 250 kilobit per second, okay? So this is something which you should uh, always keep in mind when you have to deal with rates or capacity or these kind of numbers, okay? Always ask yourself what kind of rate uh, I'm talking about. I'm talking about physical rate, I'm talking about application bit rate, uh, or so on and so forth, okay? Okay, that's the usual picture. Okay, of where we place in this uh, data rate uh, complexity power consumption plane, okay, we are far down to the left, which means that we are considering very limited data rate, okay, and we really want to be energy efficient, which means that we have to keep the complexity uh, fairly low, okay. For example, this red one is the Bluetooth bubble, so Bluetooth again is part of this uh, person here and network standards. However, Bluetooth uh, has a slightly higher bit rate, which can go up to one megabit per second, for example, okay? And in turn, uh, features a slightly higher complexity in terms of power consumption than these uh, uh, 15.4 uh, mm -hmm. solutions, okay? So we are actually far down below on the left-hand side of this, this graph, okay? Uh, other stuff is uh, far at top right. For example, Wi-Fi, 
okay, in all these uh, shades of gray, so in all these variants is uh, actually far, uh, you know, right uh, uh, in this graph. Okay? Questions so far? Okay. Um, let me just skip these two slides because it's something we have already mentioned. Okay. Uh, and let's focus one second on this Zigbee thing. Uh, so one big disclaimer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the people, most of the people uh, who speak about Zigbee, okay, actually refer to the 802.15.4 standard. Okay. In other words, the 802.15.4 standard is the standard of the two uh, bottom layers which means physical layer and minimal access control layer, okay? Zigbee is something which sits on top of these two layers. So to be 100% precise, Zigbee starts from the network layer up to the application, okay? And what is down below is different than Zigbee, okay? Uh, however, m in most of the cases when you, when you hear about uh, Zigbee, okay, what they really mean is the full stack, okay? So starting from the 15.4, up to the uh, application layer, okay? Uh, so what is the Zigbee? Uh, so in some case, uh, or in some sense, we already tried to introduce the, the Zigbee, uh, uh, let's say, initiative, which is uh, dating back uh, to the 90s, mid-90s, okay? Where actually they, I mean, the, the manufacturer and the um, let's say, end users of Internet of Things systems, they were face facing a huge problem, which was the one of interoperability, which means that everybody at that time uh, had its own IoT solution or IoT compliance solution, which means that everybody has its own system speaking its own language, okay, using its own hardware, specific hardware, okay, and so on and so forth. So there was a huge problem of uh, interoperability, okay. So what I did, uh, was uh, uh, to first launch a standardization activity at the lower layers, which is the 802.15.4 ones, okay? Why? Because it's the lower layers that, you know, they uh, have the highest impact on the interoperability issues, okay? Uh, so the IEEE launched the standardization activity and they actually uh, came out with this, uh, I mean, with the first draft of what is now the 82.15.4 in 2003, okay? Nowadays there is a new version of 15.4 uh, which is most uh, likely the same as the 2003 one, okay? Which is dated in 2006, okay? So nowadays what is running on, uh, you know, IoT systems, okay? <coughs> is a standard which dates back in 2006, okay? And this is, this is called um, 82.15.4, okay? And mistakenly, in, by someone, it's also called Zigbee, okay? Which is not Zigbee, okay? Clear? Absolutely. Yeah? In the last slide that there were uh, two, yes, this, uh, a, uh, point three is using the same, uh, power consumption but has higher data rate. Uh, yes. What is our reason that we don't use that? Okay, so um, point three is a let's say version of let's say is an evolution of point four, okay, uh, which is mainly used uh, for very short range transmissions. For example the communication between uh, uh, your set top box in your home, okay, and your TV. Okay, so very short, very short links, okay, with high, high range, okay? So it's a kind of different story here. It's a different story because 15.3 uh, uh, most likely is uh, power supply, so you, you don't have any, let's say, uh, power consumption issues there, okay? Shorter links uh, with higher data rates uh, with no power consumption issues, okay? We will see something at the end of this uh, slide set on 15.3. Okay. So again, to be 100% sure, 100% precise, uh, the two blue layers here are sorry, the first three layers here are 15.4, which belongs to IEEE. Okay, so are there three standards? Okay, Zigbee, as we will see next, uh, 
just built on top of these three layers, okay, uh, their own network layer, their own security layer, and their own applications, as, as we were saying uh, uh, yesterday, okay? So, to have a distinction between uh, what is implemented uh, in hardware, so on the silicon, and what is implemented in software, okay, the first two layers most likely are implemented here in uh, silicon, so in hardware, okay? And then there is a part of 15.04 which is usually uh, implemented in software, okay? And then all the way up uh, is all software, which means that what Zigbee Alliance did was just to build software on top of this 802.15.4 standard, okay? Clear? Again, we will get back to the full uh, uh, Zigbee stack uh, uh, later on, okay? Now we focus on the... Uh, uh, latter three layers, so the three layers at the bottom, okay? Yes, let me just switch this animation in the meantime, which is useless. Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. So why, let me go back, why there are two Mac layers here, okay? That's not actually two Mac layers, okay? It's basically uh, two parts of one single Mac layer, okay? In a sense that some of the functionalities uh, which are offered by the medium access control layer, okay, uh, they do need to expose some kind of interfaces uh, to the upper layers, okay. For example, uh, the association part, so as you will see, uh, when two node needs to associate somehow before exchanging information, okay, this is a functionality which is implemented at the lower MAC layer, However, this functionality has to, has to expose uh, some interfaces to the routing because you know the routing needs to know that there is a link between two guys, okay? Which means uh, this distinction just means that some of functionalities of the uh, MAC layer needs to have an interface, which you know, is usually a driver, it's the equivalent of a driver, okay? Uh, which needs to be exposed up above. So it's not two different MAC layers, it's just one minimum access control layer Okay, with uh, a software kind of interface or, or a soft state in between what is above, okay? Okay, so that's the same stuff. Uh, let's get to 15.4, okay? Uh, remember that 15.4 uh, has the final goal to set up uh, a kind of low-power, short-range sensor network, okay? Uh, so, one way to speak, to describe a, a network in general is to start from the building blocks of the network, so the nodes, okay, so which nodes are there, okay? Uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, the, the, the main message, the first glance message of this slide is that the network which is, uh, let's say, set up within 15.4 is not a flat one, but you know, this network has some kind of hierarchy. So it's a hierarchical network, okay? For example, if I ask you, uh, is the IP network flat or, or hierarchical? So are all the nodes the same in IP, okay, or not? Yes or not? From the perspective of layer three, so from the perspective of routing. Are they all the same? Are all the routers the same? <coughs> Who says yes? Okay, uh, answer is depends. So uh, they are not all the same, for example, because as you know, there are what are called uh, um, interior gateways, so routers which belong to the same routing domain, okay? And then there are routers in between two different routing domains, okay? So these two elements, uh, they usually have different functionalities, okay? So in general, in IP networks also, you have some kind of hierarchy uh, among routers, okay? However, in principle, the routing process, if we focus on interior domain routing uh, protocols like AODV, OLSR, and this kind of stuff, in principle, this is totally flat, which means that you have an IP address and you just look at the table, okay, and then you route uh, the packets depending on this address, regardless 
okay, the source of the packet itself, uh, regardless of the final destination uh, of the packet itself. Okay. So here in 15.4, um, or better, 15.4 uh, does define, uh, let's say, a tight, strong hierarchy of nodes of the network, which means that uh, each node in the network has a specific uh, functionality and a specific role. Okay. And in particular, the standard defines three types of uh, nodes. Let's start from the bottom. Let's start from the PAN coordinator. PAN coordinator stands for Personal Area Network Coordinator. Okay? So as the name suggests, this means that uh, uh, the 15.4 networks uh, are kind of centralized ones, in the sense that there is one central entity which acts uh, as a network coordinator, okay? which is this guy here, PAN coordinator. Okay. In few words, we will see in detail how the PAN coordinator or PAN coordinator uh, is actually responsible of building up and maintaining the network. Okay. So he is responsible of handling the association and the association of nodes okay, to the network. Okay. And is responsible to keep track uh, in real time, I would say. Uh, on who is actually associated to the network uh, at each time, okay? So, this guy here is actually the, the, the boss, the main uh, person of the network, okay? Then, uh, there are a further distinction between, uh, I mean, within all the other nodes, okay, which is the one between what is called full function <coughs> devices, okay, and uh, what is called reduced function devices. Again, let's start from the bottom. So let's go from the bottom to the top. And let's talk about uh, uh, reduced function devices. Uh, these reduced function devices are basically uh, the most minimal version of our sensor nodes. Okay? Which means that what these devices can do, or better, what these devices cannot do is, bas is basically routing. Okay? So they cannot route packets okay, which they are receiving from other devices. So then they cannot act as routers. Okay. Uh, they cannot communicate one another, which means that uh, if two reduced function devices are close together okay, and they need to exchange information, they cannot do it directly, okay, but they have to go uh, you know, through some full function device or pan coordinator. Okay. So ad hoc communications are not allowed. Uh, between reduced function devices, okay? They can only communicate with full function devices or PAN coordinators, okay? And this is, a, as I was saying, these are basically edge uh, nodes of our network, okay? So they are the leaves uh, of, our, of our network, okay? And then we have the full function devices, uh, which uh, actually uh, are the ones uh, which are allowed to uh, operate, to be operated as routers. So which are allowed to route frames, so which are allowed to receive traffic from other full function devices or from uh, other reduced function devices and route these frames uh, according to the specific routing protocol. So they are actually able to run routing protocols, okay? Uh, they are the only ones which can act as PAN coordinator. So a PAN coordinator cannot be a reduced function device. It can only be a full function device, okay? Uh, and then they can send beacons. We will get back to beacons uh, in a few moments. So they're basically, uh, let's say, uh, upper layer nodes, okay, with respect to reduced function devices. Okay. Let's keep in mind this distinction because it will be, it will say, it will become much clearer when we will talk about medium access control. So how the access is handled in these 15.4 networks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the building blocks which we can play with. So that's the building blocks of 15.4. Okay, let's see how these building blocks can be, let's say, put together to build up a network. Okay. Uh, the standard defines uh, actually two and a half topologies, meaning the standards propose uh, two topologies and supports a third topology, which we'll see in a few seconds. The first topology, which is uh, proposed and supported uh, by the standard, is the star one, so the, the easiest one. Okay? So in the star topology, you have one PAN coordinator, which is this uh, purple uh, circle here, okay? in the middle. Uh, and you have a bunch of devices uh, 
which are actually associated and connected only to the PAN coordinator. Okay, so for, so for example, here you have uh, uh, three full function devices, okay, so uh, blue nodes, uh, and uh, how many are they? Two, a couple of uh, reduced function devices, uh, they all are directly connected only to the PAN coordinator, okay, which means again, if this guy at, uh, in the left uh, is willing to send something to this guy, even if they are in range, so even if they are physically in range, okay, they have to go to the PAN coordinator. Okay, so transmission must go always to the PAN coordinator. Okay. Uh, just one comment on what supported means. Supported topology means that uh, there are procedures in the standard okay, to build up this kind of uh, uh, network uh, um, topology. Okay, so messages are defined and sequences of messages are defined to be exchanged among nodes such that in the end uh, you have uh, this virtual kind of topology implemented here. Okay? That's the easiest way of... Uh, uh, sorry, that, that's the easiest topology which is supported by this standard. Okay? Example, what is... What other networks uh, you think uh, share the same star topology as uh, 15.4? So any other example of a star topology which comes to your mind? What is in the star topology? Other examples of network sharing is star topology, virtually. Virtually meaning uh, from the communication point of view, not physically. You sh okay, several networks, the star topology, right? Okay, because if you're calling your friend, which is close by to you, you're not talking directly. You have to go up to the base station and then get down again to the train which is sitting behind you or just nearby you. What else? Even the switches and hubs are kind of stored for um, the Your colleague is saying uh, uh, switch, switches and hubs in uh, I don't know, Ethernet switch networks. Uh, uh, let's say in that case they can be actually deployed as star, okay? But they don't need to be a star necessarily, okay? You may have uh, trees, you may have uh, mesh topologies, and so on. What else? Even non-wireless. I mean, non-wireless examples of star topology. Another one ex example is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is totally star topology. So you have an access point. Uh, <laughs> if you have 10 devices connected to this access point, uh, if, they, if they need to communicate one another, they have to go through the access point. Okay? They cannot communicate directly. Okay? Uh, unless they are running uh, what is called direct Wi-Fi, but that's another story. Okay? What else? Cellular, Wi-Fi. What about Bluetooth? Bluetooth is another example of star topology. Okay, so you have uh, what is it called? Uh, one I don't remember the, the, the name. That you a master. The, the, you have a master, Bluetooth master, which is equivalent to the PAN coordinator there. Okay, and you have a bunch of they call it slaves, I guess, in Bluetooth. Okay, which are again these uh, uh, edges or leaves uh, of uh, star topology. And again, the communication can only be for the master. Okay. What else? In some sense, also in your PCs, in your uh, you know, computers, you have a kind of star topology, right? So you have your peripherals, which are connected somehow with, through some buses to the uh, CPU or whatever, okay? And in some sense, uh, uh, the topology is uh, Star-like, uh, because the communication needs to go through some, you know, central intelligence, which can be, for example, a microcontroller. Okay. Clear. Okay. So here, everything is star. I mean, the first uh, topology which is supported is star one. Okay. Uh, then the second topology is the meshed one. Okay. Uh, where basically uh, everybody can actually communicate with everybody else uh, with a constraint, though, 
that two reduced function devices cannot communicate one another. Okay, so for example, in this case you have uh, two reduced function devices. Okay, uh, they cannot communicate by contract. Okay, so they cannot run uh, direct communication. They always need to go through full function device. However, you can have a mesh uh, among full function devices. So two full function devices can actually get in touch, uh, even if uh, uh, they, I mean, they don't need to go through the pan coordinator to to transmit information. Okay, clear. Why? This ones? Yes, the reduced functions. Uh, question is why the two reduced function devices uh, uh, cannot communicate one another? So what's the what's the reason? What's the rationale? What do you think? So the main reason is to keep it simple, in the sense that uh, these use function devices are our sensor nodes. So what we have called sensor nodes, okay? Which means that they can be there or not, okay? So they can be active or not, they can sleep or not, okay? If uh, there weren't any upper higher layer device here, okay? Uh, handling the direct communication would be more difficult. Okay, because they would need some distributed way to, as I was saying, synchronize their active period, for example, okay, uh, to exchange the information in a meaningful way, <coughs> knowing that they are not active all the time, okay, and that would have required, you know, higher overhead in terms of message exchange and so on and so forth, okay. So to keep it simple, okay, having a higher layer node, which, for example, can handle the synchronization of the transmissions, or sorry, the activity period synchronization of the two reduced function devices is much more convenient, okay? Because the main idea is that these guys here, the green ones, are most likely battery operated, so they have limited, sorry, they have tight constraints in terms of, in terms of energy and resources. As you go up to this pyramid, so these two function devices may have power supply, so they can just uh, need, uh, sorry, they can just use more resources than others, okay? So basically, Limiting the functionalities of the reduced function devices means that you are pushing all the intelligence okay, to the full function devices, which are power operate, power supplied, okay, or even to the pump coordinator, which is the most powerful node in the net. Okay? Questions? Okay, the last topology, uh, which is actually not in 15.4 standard, okay, but is, act is actually implemented uh, uh, at the network layer of the Zigbee standard, okay, this is a called cluster tree topology, okay, uh, which means that I have still a pump coordinator here, okay, and then the uh, let's say communication pattern is uh, uh, managed through a tree, okay, a kind of tree where you have you know different layers in the tree, okay. And uh, each layer of the tree may be composed of function devices or reduced function devices. Okay, and then in the end, uh, in the end, uh, you have what is called uh, tree leaves, uh, foglie. Okay, so the edges of the tree are these guys here, which are the leaves of the tree. Okay, uh, which are actually just sending up traffic. Okay, so why you think uh, they were? I mean, they thought of. Uh, designing only these kind of topologies. So what is the uh, reason why this cluster tree topology is, uh, let's say, uh, fine with typical IoT systems? Because if we have too many users, we can cluster them and say it's work together. Okay, okay. What else? So what he's saying is that if I have too many users, I can just clone the pump coordinator, make smaller uh, trees like this, or stars, okay, and I can just can end the complexity in this way. What else? One of the nodes, uh, one of the nodes, uh, huh? One of the nodes, yeah. Nodes. Okay, but that, what he's saying is that uh, if one node fails, this is better, right, than others? Is, that, is this what you're saying? Then? 
or you're safe. I'm saying that uh, like if uh, one of the FFT is uh, stop working, yeah. then we can't reach to the uh, reduced topology. Okay, so that's an, a, a disadvantage of this topology, right? With respect to the mesh one. So why they just stick with this mesh topology? So why they just proposing to have this uh, cluster three topology? Maybe because of the cluster of device. Like what? I don't know, maybe uh, for example a refrigerator and a car. They are two different devices, so huh? they have a different connection to the facility. Okay, so Have different, uh, different control signals. Okay. So let me put it like this. Let's say 90%, 90% of the real deployments of these networks is like this. So either is either a star deployment or a cluster tree one. So the mesh deployment is uh, very scarcely used. Okay. Why? So what you what are you losing in uh, cluster three with respect to mesh? The only thing you're losing is direct communication, right? But so everything doesn't need to communicate with everything. For example, if this is a smart and this is a smart, they need to communicate with me not to get right. Exactly because uh, in most of the applications of IoT system, traffic is what is called converged cast. So they just need to go to a central point. Okay. I just need to monitor the temperature, I just need to monitor something, I just need to uh, have the information in some place, okay? I don't really need the sensor nodes to communicate one another, okay? Which means that uh, uh, the easiest topology which supports converged cast traffic is a tree, okay? So traffic which flows from the leaves to a center point, uh, the easiest way you can do it is a tree, okay? That's why we, they, I mean, they are using in practice uh, this kind of tree or star <coughs> topologies, which is just a one hope tree, okay, uh, to design to design applications. Obviously what you lose, as your guy, as your colleague was saying, is uh, for example robustness to failures, okay, if a branch of the tree, if one node in the tree fails, you have to rebuild all the branch of the tree, okay, and what you're using is actually data communication. So if you have cases where your sensor uh, do really need to communicate one another, okay? For example, if this guy here is in range with this guy here, okay, and they need to communicate, in this topology they have to go up all the way up to the pump coordinator and down again, okay, which is not efficient, okay? So if you have, let's say, uh, cases where you really need to have uh, direct communication, you may switch to mesh ones. But since most, in most of the cases, uh, you really need to have only converged cast traffic, uh, that's why they're using star and uh, cluster tree topologies. Okay? Clear? Okay, so we know which are the building blocks, we know how, at least uh, at high level, we can uh, set them together, okay, in building up networks, okay. What we have to learn now is actually how to do that, so which are the procedures to, you know, have this network up and running, okay? <coughs> So let's start from the physical layer, okay? So remember that 15.4 is, is composed of uh, physical, uh, lower layer part, uh, split in three different, uh, let's say, uh, substandards, okay? And the medium access control part. We'll start uh, at the physical layer. So what you see listed in the slides is basically all the, func uh, the functionalities or services which are offered by the physical layer. So all the stuff which the physical layer can actually implement by standard, okay? So the first thing, uh, the first main functionality which the physical layer can actually implement, uh, again, let's start from the very bottom, is data transmission and reception. That's very obvious, right? So any physical layer must be able to send something out, otherwise it's useless, okay? Uh, let's go up to the top, okay? The other functionalities is activate and deactivate the radio which means that since we are talking about the networks running in a duty cycle way, we need to switch on and off very frequently or with some frequency the radio, which means that the physical layer, which is the one responsible of, of handling the physical resources, okay, must be able to do that, which means that you must have hooks, okay, 
which you can use to uh, communicate with the physical layer that you need to switch on and off the radio. Okay? And, that's it. and this is the first uh, bullet there. Activate and deactivate the radio. Okay? And then you have a bunch of functionalities uh, which are related to uh, the channel access part. Okay? The first one is the so-called uh, ED functionality, energy detection, okay? uh, which is basically uh, a functionality used uh, to develop scanning kind of uh, uh, procedures, okay? which is actually returning the uh, energy level which is overheard by the physical layer on a specific channel. Okay? So if you think, uh, this, is, uh, this, this functionality is, is basically at the base, at the very base of any scanner of uh, you know, spectrum, bandwidth, and so on and so forth. Okay? So I just switch on a channel. Okay? I see if there is enough energy on that channel, so if, if there is anything on that channel. Okay? And if so, I go on. Otherwise, I go to another channel. Suppose I want to enter a network, okay, I have to switch on a specific channel which is used by the network. The first step I have to do is to check whether we have uh, activity on that channel. Okay? And this is basically done in this energy detection function. Okay? Uh, then I have a third functionality here which is very useful, which is called the link quality indicator functionality. Okay? which is able for every received packet, so for every received transmission, okay, to uh, define the quality of this transmission in terms of uh, the quality of the received piece of information. Okay? So, uh, usually this uh, LQI, link quality indicator, okay, uh, is the basically received signal strength. So, how, how strong you are actually receiving the signal out of a specific packet you have actually received. Okay? And again, this is a very, very useful functionality for implementing several you know, uh, upper layers, uh, protocols, and solutions. Okay? Can you have an example? So what you could use this LQI functionality for? This is, I received the packet out of the link. Okay? And I'm saying that uh, this reception process uh, has a quality of uh, 10, 20, or whatever. And this quality is basically uh, measuring the quality of the link. Okay? What could you use it for? Video streaming. Like what? If you want to base the, um, the quality of the video depending on uh, the quality of the link. So you could uh, use this indicator to manage it. For example, so you could use it in any application which uh, uh, is, uh, let's say, link quality sensitive. Okay, so you could adapt, as you were saying, the the code creator video depending on the quality of the link. Okay, what else? Can you use this? For upper layers, for example, uh, we check the quality, and if the quality, for example, was not good, so we assume that uh, there are some uh, noise or, uh, or errors, so we put a more uh, complex error uh, correction in the upper layer. For example, you could, you know, yeah, you could do what's called the uh, forward correction or hybrid uh, coding by just, just by modulating the code rate. Depending on the quality, yeah. What else? There's one main thing you could do if you know a quality of the link in general, right? Huh? Okay, okay. Yeah, you could feed back this information to your transmitter, and for example, it could you know have a stronger coding. That's what they were saying. But there's one you know fundamental thing which you could do if you're able to monitor the quality of a link in general, right? Which is choosing. Yeah. 
So that's another fundamental one. So there is two more. So what he's saying is that I can have a kind of power control the functionality. So if a link uh, has a quality which is too high, it may mean that transmitter is using too much power, so it I may feedback uh, the information the transmitter to let him lower down the power he's using, okay, thus uh, uh, sparing energy. Okay, yes, power control. One last thing. So there's two, another, another one. <laughs> okay, so yes, you could use it in uh, if you have multiple choices in terms of PAN coordinators you want to connect to. You may want to connect to the strongest one in terms of the receive signal quality or LQI. What else? So if you have multi-hop uh, networks, so multi-hop links, okay, you may want to use this uh, quality measure on each single link uh, within the routing protocol. Okay, so you may want to choose the path, the sequences of link. Okay, uh, minimizing or maximizing, uh, for example, the link quality indicator. So you may want to choose the end-to-end -end path, okay, which is maximum, which is optimal from the LQI point of view. Okay. What is the easiest metric you're using in routing? So what kind of routes you choose in the internet, in the classical internet? The shortest, huh? the shortest path. The shortest path on which metric? Ops. Ops, right? So number of routers which you are traversing with your information. Okay? That's fine in wired networks, so with cables. Okay? In wireless networks, you may want to have something which is more representative on the quality of the link itself, okay? And the LQI is uh, you know, this kind of information you can use. So we'll see that some of the routing protocols defined in ZigBee and 6 Lopen actually use this LQI as a metric to uh, manage routes and decides which route are to be used, okay? <clears throat> then this other one is a you know, kind of... Uh, naive uh, and uh, still important functionality which is called clear channel assessment uh, or CCA okay uh, which is the very same functionality offered for example by the physical layer of Wi-Fi okay <laughs> this functionality is basically telling you whether there is activity on the channel okay uh, why is it important because uh, it's at the very heart at the core of uh, the access process, which is called CSMA, carrier sense multiple access, okay, with collision avoidance, okay? So before transmitting, you're just checking if you, have, if you see activities by some other, some other guy on the same channel, okay? If yes, you just refrain, if not, you can go, okay? And then, obviously, you have this last uh, functionality, here, functionality here, which is called channel selection or channel frequency selection which means that the physical layer must be able to tune on one specific uh, channel bandwidth, okay? So we have mentioned that uh, uh, 15.4 works in uh, three different bands, okay? These three bands has three different sizes, dimensions, okay? And each one of these three bands uh, is subdivided into different channels, sub-channels, okay? Which means that the physical layer can actually be tuned to operate in any of these uh, I guess it's 16 different channels, okay? Which means that the physical layer must be able to select the center frequency to be used for transmission, okay? Clear? Questions? Okay. Okay, so uh, this is a table which shows the main features of the different uh, physical layers. Okay, uh, we have mentioned so far. Okay, uh, let's say that the, the, the most important information which you should get uh, out of this uh, table is uh, the bitrate uh, line column here. Okay, uh, which means that, uh, as I was saying before, okay, you can go up to 250 kilometers in the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. Okay, which means that uh, uh, let's, let's 
say, four times slower than, for example, Bluetooth, okay, in uh, the best case, okay? Uh, just one comment on which band to be used, okay? So either sub gigahertz or above gigahertz, so 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, which band to use, again, depends on the, uh, guess what, the application. Depends on the environment, okay? Um, what would you think would be a decision guideline to choose the bandwidth? So would you use, uh, when would you use uh, uh, sub-gigahertz physical layer and when would you use it, uh, uh, when, when would you use a uh, 2.4 gigahertz physical layer? Suppose you don't have problems in data rate. So meaning that uh, it's enough for you to have 20 kilobit per second. Okay, which is the what is provided by sub gigahertz data rate, the sub gigahertz physical layer. What would you use? A sub gigahertz one or a 2.4 gigahertz one? And why? Like what? As, is, as she's saying, it depends on distance, which means that. Uh, um, as you should know from uh, kind of uh, propagation, wireless propagation courses, okay, different bands have different features in terms of the propagation loss. So, for the very same level of emitted power, okay, the received power is different uh, depending on the bands you're actually using, okay. And the rough uh, rule is that the lower the frequency. Okay, the higher the range, meaning that, uh, in the, for example, in this case, uh, the sub gigahertz standard, they allow you to go more farther away than 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, because in that spectrum range, you have more favorable propagation conditions. Okay, so which one to use? It really depends on your application. If you have to reach out, uh, for example, kilometers, okay. Of range, uh, you cannot use 2.4 gigahertz, okay, unless you would, unless you would be required to use uh, huge powers, emitted powers, okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you don't have a limitation on the range you have to reach, uh, but you have a more tight limitation on the data rate you need to have, uh, okay, you would like to use uh, 2.4 gigahertz and leave aside uh, sub gigahertz uh, physical layers, okay. Clear. The yeah. price are the same. The price of the, for example, the devices. Price are... is nowadays almost the same. Yes. Yeah. The price of the cheap, the radio part uh, is almost the same. The reason being that uh, um, in most of the cases, uh, what is uh, implemented or what is used is actually what is called software-defined radio. So the, the hardware is the same. What changes is the software and bands you're using is basically software defined okay so the cost is the same okay because the hardware is actually the same very same hardware, okay then you then you may have some differences in the antennas in the cost of the antennas but that's very negligible so the cost is the same questions okay so uh what we're doing now is just to go up uh, and see what's happening at the upper layers. Before uh, doing that, let's see what is the atomic piece of information which is exchanged at the physical layer. Okay. <coughs> Always remember that we are talking about uh, packet switch networks, which means that the information which is uh, exchanged between any uh, protocol uh, at the same layer okay, is packets, or PDUs, packet data units. Okay. Uh, and what you see in this slide is basically the PDU format uh, of uh, a physical layer um, frame. Okay, I am assuming that you're all familiar with the concept of uh, PDU. Are you? Packet data unit, packet, string of bits. That's very naive, right? So uh, again, I'm not interested in that you remember all the fields of a uh, specific PDU at the given layer, okay? So uh, the reason why we are actually commenting 
in this course and I guess in all the courses about networking on the format of packets is because uh, in the packet uh, you find uh, all the pieces of information which are needed to, let's say, be, to be able to interpret what, which are the services offered at that layer. Okay? For example, this is the format of the PDU frame at the physical layer. Okay? Uh, as always happens, uh, you have uh, the payload, okay, which is the data part, so the, the bits which are coming from the upper layers, the data part of the PDU. Okay? And then you have uh, a signaling part or a bunch of signaling bits, which is the header, which is called the header. Okay? Uh, and uh, at the physical layer, the header part is actually divided into two subparts. Uh, the first part uh, and the second part, okay? The fields in the first part uh, are the preamble field and the star frame delimiter field, okay? Uh, the preamble, I guess you are familiar with the concept of preamble, right? Are you? That's very easy. So, any physical layer or any physical transmission of bits or strings of bits, okay? Uh, is based on the synchronization between the transmitter and the receiver. In the sense that the receiver, in order for being able to correctly receive the bits sent by the transmitter, okay, must synchronize to the string of bits which is received, actually. Okay? Which means that uh, synchronization is not immediate, okay, but takes some time. So the receiver takes some time to get in sync with the uh, with the sequence of bits sent by the sent by the by the transmitter, okay, and uh, that's why we always have at physical layer in packet switch networks at least uh, a preamble, which is a string of bits which is meaningless, okay, which is just used uh, as a time for the receiver to get synchronized with the transmitter, okay. So uh, the time taken for the receiver to get in sync with the clock rate, uh, not the clock rate, the transmission rate uh, of the uh, transmitter, okay? So after this preamble, we have this so-called SVD, SFD, sorry, start frame delimiter, which is basically, once the receiver has synchronized with the transmitter, so once the receiver is actually able to receive each single bit sent by the transmitter, okay, the receiver needs to know where the frame starts. So it needs to know where to start looking for meaningful bits, okay? And this process is accomplished by just checking uh, on the presence in the string of bits, received bits, uh, of this star frame delimiter, which is a known sequence of bits, uh, which is just saying to the receiver, fine, this is starting a frame, okay? Clear? So the receiver has, gets synchronized, then it it, it does get to know that the frame is starting, which means that uh, at this bit here, it is interpreting the bits which follow okay, as a new physical frame. Okay? So the next frame uh, field is a frame length, which is the, as the name says, it just tells the receiver how long is the frame. Okay? Uh, and this is kind of useful for different uh, reasons. The first one being uh, uh, to pre-allocate memory in the receiver buffer, okay? Which means that uh, with this information here, the receiver can just uh, have some space ready in the receiver buffer, okay, to store the upcoming frame, okay? And then this information is also useful for the upper layers, as we'll see in the next. Then I have these reserve bits, just one bit which is reserved for future uses, which is, again, a common practice in standards, okay? And then I have the data. Okay? That's very, very, I would say, simple and straight uh, framing for the physical layer. Okay? So if I ask you, uh, which are the services uh, which are offered by the physical layer, just by looking at the frame? Okay? Besides all the functionalities or services we have seen in the previous slide, uh, we can say that the physical layer is also able to provide synchronization to manage synchronization between transmitter and receiver, is able to do framing, so frame start and frame end, okay? Uh, and that's pretty much it. So, 
uh, in addition to all the services which we have seen before, okay, just by looking at the frame, uh, we can say that the physical layer, in this case, without having also to know what kind of physical layer we're talking about, uh, we can say that this physical layer is also able to handle synchronization and uh, frame recognition, okay, starting and ending of the frame, okay? Uh, one very quick comment on the frame length. As you can see, the maximum size of a frame uh, at the physical layer is under 27 bytes, okay? Which is very, very small, very tiny, okay? Do you know what the frame size of Wi-Fi? No? Is it is it higher, obviously? But can you guess how, how higher? It's 1,500, meaning 1,500 bytes, the maximum frame size for Wi-Fi, okay? So we are talking about one order of magnitude more than what is allowed here, okay? Under 27 bytes, okay? Always keep in mind this number, okay? Uh, and be advised that this number is a physical layer limitation. So a maximum frame size at the physical layer. Okay, including all the headers of the upper layer protocols, MAC, routing, control, uh, application. Okay, which means that out of these bytes here available in the uh, frame length, sorry, in the frame, in the physical layer fra frame, you have to subtract uh, all the headers of the upper layer protocols, and what is left is what the, the application can actually convey in one single packet, okay, which is you know. A very, very tight limitation. Questions? Okay, so this is pretty much it uh, on what I was willing to say about the physical layer, okay? Uh, and what we are doing here is to start looking at the medium access control uh, layer or sub-layer. And we are actually doing the same uh, way we did for the physical layer. So we are looking at First, the services offered by the medium access control, okay, and then we are looking at how these services are actually offered, okay. Um, so this is a bunch of uh, high-level functionalities offered by the medium access control, okay. Uh, some of those may be familiar to you, okay. For example, channel access management, which means that the medium access control uh, has to provide uh, ways to manage the access to the shared resource, which is the, the, the physical channel, okay, among multiple stations, okay. Uh, the medium access control has to provide association and disassociation functionalities, which means that uh, uh, nodes in 15.4 uh, are associated or become associated at layer 2, which means that there is a layer 2 medium access control layer association process in 15.4, okay. Uh, and then the other stuff here, okay, like GTS management, decom management, will become clear uh, in the next uh, in the next slide. Okay, what is uh, already what may be already clear to you is frame validation and acknowledgement and delivery. Okay, frame validation means that uh, at the at the medium access control layer there are ways to check the uh, integrity of a frame. Okay. Uh, for example, you may have heard about uh, frame check sequence codes in the packets, which are just telling you if the string of bits you have received of a frame uh, makes sense or not. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, acknowledgement of frame delivery is basically uh, dealing with uh, what's called ARQs, so automatic repeat request uh, process. Uh, if one frame gets lost, uh, the loss must be somehow uh, recognized by the receiver, okay, and an acknowledgement uh, may be sent uh, if the frame uh, was uh, successfully received, okay. So this is basically basic functionalities which you uh, happen to find in any uh, layer two protocol, okay. The two new ones, which are now not clear to you uh, at this moment, are GTS management and vehicle management, which will become clear in two seconds, okay. 
So, how does the medium access control work? Okay, there are two ways or two operation mode. Okay, the first one is the so-called beacon enabled mode. Okay, uh, in beacon enabled mode, the uh, PAN coordinator uh, basically manages centrally the access to the shared resource, which means that the PAN coordinator periodically transmits beacon. Okay. And these beacons, as we will see, they contain all the information which are uh, used, which is used by the nodes, okay, to decide when they actually have to access to the channel. So it's a fully scheduled kind of access mechanism. Okay, is it clear? So basically, through these beacons, the PAN coordinator tells everybody else when they have to transmit or when they have to receive. Totally controlled and centralized. Okay. Uh, this beacon enable mode is usually adopted, applied to start topologies. So when you have actually a PAN coordinator and the communication can happen only between the PAN coordinator and the nodes, okay? Uh, and is operated in, in a way which is locked to CSMA, which will again become clear in a few seconds, okay? So the beacon enable mode is the most used mode. Uh, in uh, real deployments of uh, 15.4 networks. Okay? Then there is also a non beacon enabled mode where basically, as you can guess, there's no beacons, which means that there's no controlled access by the PAN coordinator. Okay? But basically, the sensors, reduced function devices, full function devices, they can do whatever they want in terms of, run, in terms of access to the channel. Okay? which means that the channel must be managed uh, through some kind of random access control protocol, which in this case is the CSMACA one. Okay? Clear? Again, let's say 80% of the deployment are beacon enabled. Okay, 20% I was, let's say, too generous. Let's say 90% is beacon enabled and 10% is non-beacon enabled. Okay? At least what I've seen so far. So let's have a look more specifically now at how the access is managed in both ways. Okay? So what is the access control scheme in, in both ways? Okay? Uh, very short uh, digression on channel access. So the problem is uh, to share a common medium. Okay? Uh, in this case, the frequency channel. So it's the, the medium we are competing for is the frequency. Okay? And as you know from other courses, there are two ways to, to do that. Okay, the first one is the schedule access. Okay, schedule access means that there is someone which tells everybody else when they have to talk. Okay, and the schedule access, uh, uh, you cannot have collisions, which means that since the access is fully controlled, two stations, two nodes cannot collide. I mean, their transmission cannot collide. Okay. Uh, Usually, this schedule access is implemented through some polling scheme, which means that there is a central entity which polls, which provides, grants the access to stations in some order, okay? Uh, and usually, this is implemented in a centralized way, which means that there is a central entity doing that, okay? On the other way around, you have the so-called random access, okay? Uh, the principle is uh, everybody decides when he wants to talk, okay? uh, which means that uh, there might be collisions if two agents take a colliding uh, decision. Okay? But uh, you have to be wise, so you have to recover from a collision in a, let's say, efficient way. Okay? Uh, which means that uh, collision needs to be resolved, and usually the way collisions are resolved is through some randomization process. Like if two collided, the next time the probability they collided again is lowered. Okay? And so on and so forth. This should be something which should already be clear, right? Is it clear? Yes, good. So, examples, uh, schedule access, you can find it in uh, DSM, for example. It's a scheduled kind of access. Okay, once you have your resources, it's yours. Nobody can, no one else can use the same slots for their calls okay, as yours. Okay? At least not in the same base station. Um, Bluetooth is a schedule access. 
So you have a master which tells everybody else when they have to talk, okay? And also a version of Wi-Fi which is called PCF, is schedule access, but it's not actually used, okay? So uh, it's a bad example in this sense. So which are the advantages of schedule access? You have guaranteed performance because you don't have collisions, which means that you can assign, pre-assign the bandwidth to users such that their performance is guaranteed somehow, okay? Uh, the cons are that you need coordination, which means that you need to have a central entity and you need to have signaling from the central entity to the nodes, okay, which costs, okay, which is cost in terms of, for example, signaling over and so on, okay? What about random access? Random access is much easier to implement because it's a distributed kind of access. Everybody does whatever he wants. I mean, everybody runs locally a protocol, okay, without having to have a centralized entity, okay. Um, so resources are accessed opportunistically, okay. The disadvantage is collisions, which means that uh, if you have, uh, uh, if the load on the shared resource is too high, okay, the performance uh, can be very poor, okay, which means that the performance you get uh, depends on the load of the chain, okay. So you cannot guarantee a priori, okay, a specific level of performance to the accessing nodes. Okay? Clear? So let's see what 8.15.4 does uh, in this context. Okay? So in this context, the resource to be shared is uh, a channel frequency, and each single channel frequency, each, each single channel, is uh, shared depending on time. So it's a time kind time division uh, access uh, uh, rule or protocol. Okay. So what Fifty Four is using is actually a mixture of these two uh, paradigms in terms of channel access, meaning scheduled and random access. Okay. Uh, the scheduled access part of this scheme is managed by the PAN coordinator. So as I was saying, it's the PAN coordinator which in beacon enable mode tells all the nodes underneath when they have to talk, okay? Uh, random access, okay, is allowed uh, between uh, full function devices, between uh, reduced function devices and full function devices towards the PAN coordinator in specific time intervals, okay? Clear? Let's see it in work. So it may become clearer, okay? And that's the, let's say, temporal representation of uh, uh, the, the channel access scheme. So uh, let's s uh, focus on one second on beacon enable mode. So we are working in the operation mode where the PAN coordinator is sending out beacons, okay, periodically, okay? Uh, the temporal evolution of the channel access is so, uh, let's say, uh, triggered by these beacons, okay? So what you can see here is basically that the PAN coordinator send a beacon in this slot, which is the zero one, okay? And then it keeps sending the beacon with a given period, okay? The time interval between two consecutive beacons is called the beacon interval, okay? And the channel access happens in between this beacon interval. Okay. This temporal, this uh, time interval, temporal interval is further splitted in two different, uh, let's say, zones. The first one, the white one in the slide, is the active zone, meaning the zone where all the nodes in the network are active. Okay. And uh, the second one is the inactive one, where all the nodes in the network goes to sleep. Okay. This is the duty cycling which we were talking about uh, last time, okay? So this means that if this network has one PAN coordinator and 100 devices, okay, all the 101 devices will be on during this white part of the frame, and then they will switch off all together synchronously in the inactive part of the frame, okay? Clear? Okay, so the real resource which needs to be shared among these 100 devices or n device is the white part of the frame, right? That's the active part of the frame which needs to be shared among different nodes, okay? 
this part of the frame, the white part of the frame, so this part here, okay, which is called the super frame, okay, I don't know why actually, it's called the super frame, okay, uh, is further divided into two parts, okay. The first part, which is called CAP, collision access part, okay, is a bunch of slots, time slots, okay, which can be used by full function devices, reduced function devices, and fan coordinator, okay, to uh, access to the channel in a random way. So that's where the random access uh, can happen, okay, to support communication among nodes, okay. So in this first part here, okay, station can just compete to get access to the channel. Okay. The second part of this super frame, so the second part of the active part of the beacon interval, okay, is called the collision or contention free part, okay, and that's where the scheduled access takes place. Okay. The collision free part, the CFP there, okay, is uh, uh, subdivided into different time slots, which are called guaranteed time slot, GTS, okay? And these time slots, these time resources, okay, are scheduled, which means that they are assigned to uh, each single station, okay, by the time coordinator. Clear? So what I'm saying is that if we look at one beacon interval, what happens is the following. The time coordinator fires a beacon, uh, beacon message, so which is a signaling message at slot zero. Okay. This message is received by all the nodes in the star topology. Okay. And this message contains, as we will see, all the information okay, about the structure of the beacon interval okay, and about the schedule part of the beacon interval, meaning that in this beacon here, the beacon, the pan coordinator will signal, okay, which slots in the guaranteed time slot part can actually be used by all the nodes in the network itself. So the information in this beacon referring to the guaranteed time slot part is like device 1 will use slot 11, device Two will use slot 15, device 3 will use slot 9, and so on and so forth for all the devices in the scheduled part. Okay? Then all the devices can actually also compete in the uh, collision access part uh, for additional resources than the scheduled ones. Okay? Clear? Okay. The beacon also contains, as I was saying, uh, the full structure of the frame, sorry, full structure of the beacon interval, which means that it contains, for example, how long the collision access part uh, must be, okay? So how many slots can be used for open competition among nodes, okay? And as a result, also how many slots can be used for the scheduled part for all the nodes, okay? and also contains basically the equivalent of the duty cycle factor, okay? So it contains the ratio between the uh, active part of the super frame and the beacon interval duration, okay? So the pump coordinator has the full responsibility to actually uh, set down all the playground for the network, meaning what is the duty cycle of all the sensors, okay? When they have to access in a scheduled manner, this is the GTS, okay? and when they can actually access uh, in a random manner, which is the CAP cap. Okay? Clear? Questions? So, uh, in the following slides, we will see how all this information can actually be conveyed in a beacon, in a single message. So what kind of information we need in the beacon, such that all the nodes uh, are able to build up in a distributed way, this kind of same representation of a beacon interval, okay? And we will also see what is the process uh, for uh, the nodes to access randomly, okay, in the collision access plan. Okay, so that's the plan for, I guess, next week now, okay? 
So the plan for next week, to be more precise, is on Wednesday to Wednesday, yes, on Wednesday to finish up uh, the part on 15.4, and on Thursday, uh, most likely to have uh, some exercises, some first exercises on uh, this first part of the course, meaning uh, power models and 15.4. Uh, okay. Okay, see you next uh, Wednesday. Too.